Okay, welcome back to Anne of Green Gables. We are in chapter 15. The word is deigning, ostentatiously, amiable, fry, and it does not mean like French fry, and handier are the words left in this chapter. Yes. We are. Fire up. Here we go. If you're crying, you have a problem. Okay, so remember you're talking about scapegoat. And Shirley, since you seem to be so fond of the boys, company, we shall indulge your taste for it this afternoon, he said sarcastically. Take those flowers out of your hair and sit with Gilbert Blythe. The other boys snickered. Diana, turning pale with pity, plucked the wreath from Anne's hair and squeezed her hand. Anne stared at the master as if to turn to stone. Did you hear what I said, Anne? queried Mr. Phillips sternly. Yes, sir, said Anne slowly. But I don't, didn't suppose you really meant it. I assure you I did still with the sarcastic inflection with which all the children, and Anne especially, hated. It flicked on the raw, Obey me at once! For a moment, Anne looked as if she meant to disobey. Then, realizing that there was no help for it, she rose haughtily, stepped across the aisle, sat down beside Gilbert Blythe, and buried her face in her arms on the desk. Ruby Gillis, who got a glimpse of it as it went down, told the others going home from school that she'd actually never seen anything like it. It was so white with awful little red spots in it. That's what her face looked like, white with little red spots in it. To Anne, this was the end of all things. It was bad enough to be singled out for punishment from among a dozen equally guilty ones. It was worse still to be sent to sit with a boy. But that that boy should be Gilbert Blythe was heaping insult on injury to a degree of utterly unbearable. Anne felt that she could not bear it and would, and it would be of no use to try. Her whole being seethed with shame and anger and humiliation. At first, the other scholars looked and whispered and giggled and nudged. But as Anne never lifted her head, and as Gilbert worked fractions as if his whole soul, thank you, was absorbed in them, and them only, they returned to their own tasks, and Anne was forgotten. When Mr. Phillips called the history class out, Anne should have gone, but Anne did not move. And Mr. Phillips, who had been writing some verses to Priscilla before he called the class, was thinking about an obstinate rhyme still in never missed her. Once, when nobody was looking, Gilbert took from his desk a little pink candy heart with a gold motto on it, You Are Sweet, and slipped it under the curve of Anne's arm. Whereupon, Anne arose, took the pink heart gingerly between the two tips of her fingers, and dropped it on the floor and ground it to a powder beneath her heel and resumed her position without deigning to bestow a glance on Gilbert. What do you think deigning means? Deigning. It does, but it's not. What? It's not imagining, so she's deigning means she's looking down upon what? So it's kind of like she's looking down upon 
and she's offended. Like, I cannot believe that you did that. Why in the world did you give me a piece of candy? I am so offended. She's looking down upon, and she's offended. She's upset by it. Okay. When school was out, Anne marched to her desk ostentatiously, took out everything therein, books and writing tablet, pen and ink, testament and arithmetic, and piled them neatly on her cracked slate. So she never got a new slate. She's got it, her slate still broken. What do you, slate is the thing, like a whiteboard, except instead of writing with a dry erase marker, they wrote with chalk. So what do you think ostentatiously means? Yep. Uh, when school went out, Anne marched to her desk, ostentatiously took out everything therein, books and writing tablet, pen and ink, testament and arithmetic, and piled them neatly on her cracked slate. I think she was angry. I think you're right there, but but that's not what that word. She is agitated. This one is she's trying to seek attention. So she's attracting. or seeking to attract attention. Yeah, yeah, I was moving it up, thanks. So it's kind of like when somebody's mad, they're like, <gasps> and then they're like, do, 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 do to somewhere, right? So, so she wants everybody to see that she's doing it. Okay. What are, why, what are you taking all those things home for? And Diana wanted to know as soon as they were out on the road, she had dared not to ask, she had not dared to ask the question before. I am not coming back to school any more, said Anne. Diana gasped <gasps> and stared at Anne as if to see if she meant it. Not what we're doing right now. Um, will Marilla let you stay home, she asked. She'll have to, said Anne. I'll never go to school to that man again. Oh, Anne, Diana looked as if she was ready to cry. I do think you're mean. What, what shall I do? Mr. Phillips will make me sit with that horrid Gertie pie. I know you will because she is sitting alone. Do come back, Anne. I do almost anything in the world for you, Diana, said Anne sadly. I'd let myself be torn limb from limb if it would do you any good. But I can't do this, so please don't ask it. You harrow up my very soul. Just think of all the fun you'll miss, mourned Diana. We are going to build the loveliest new house down by the brook and we'll be playing ball next week. And you've never played ball, and it's tremendously exciting. And we're going to learn a new song. Jane Andrews is practicing it up now. And Alice Andrews is going to bring a new pansy book next week. And we're all going to read it aloud, chapter by chapter, down by the brook. And you know you're so fond of reading out loud, Anne. Nothing moved Anne in the least. Her mind was made up. She would not go to school to Mr. Phillips again. She told Marilla so when she got home. Now, let's think about this. If you were to go home and you were to tell your mom or dad or the people that loved you at home that you were never going to school, no matter what, how do you think they would respond? Oh, that's probably not going to happen. All right, let's see what happens. Nonsense, said Marilla. It isn't nonsense at all, said Anne, gazing at Marilla with solemn, reproachful eyes. Don't you understand, Marilla? I've been insulted. Insulted fiddlesticks. You'll go to school tomorrow as usual. Oh, no. Anne shook her head gently. I'm not going back, Marilla. I'll learn my lessons at home. 
and I'll be as good as I can be and hold my tongue all the time if it's possible at all. But I will not go back to school, I assure you. Marilla saw something remarkably, something remarkably like unyielding stubbornness looking out of Anne's small face. She understood that she would have trouble in overcoming it, but she resolved wisely to say nothing more just then. I'll run down and see Rachel about it this evening, she thought. There's no use reasoning with Anne now. She's too worked up, and I have an idea she can be awful stubborn if she takes the notion. Far as I can make out from her story, Mr. Phillips has been carrying matters with a rather high hand, but it would never do to say so to her. I'll just talk it over with Rachel. She sent ten children to school, and she ought to know something about it. She'll have heard the whole story, too, by this time. Marilla found Mrs. Lynde's knitting quilts as industriously and cheerful as usual. I suppose you know what I've come about, she said a little shamefacedly. Rachel, Aunt, Mrs. Rachel nodded. About Anne's fuss in school, I reckon, she said. Tilly Bolter was on her way home from school and told me about it. Not much passes Mrs. Lynde, does it? I don't know what to do with her, said Marilla. She declares she won't go back to school. I never saw a child so worked up. I've been expecting trouble ever since she started to school. I knew things were going too smooth to last. She's so high strung. What would you advise, Rachel? Well, since you've asked my advice, Marilla said Mrs. Lynde at amiably. Mrs. Lynde dearly loved to be asked for advice. I just humor her a little at first. That's what I do. It's my belief that Mr. Phillips was in the wrong. Of course, it doesn't do to say so to the children, you know. And of course, he did write to he did write to punish her yesterday for giving way to her to temper. But today it was different. The others who were late should have been punished as well as Anne. That's why. And I don't believe in making the girls sit with the boys for punishment. It isn't modest. Tilly Bolter was real indignant. She took Anne's part right through and said all the scholars did too. Anne seems real popular among them somehow. I never thought she'd take with them so well. What do you think amiably means? It says, well, since you've asked my advice, Marilla, said Mrs. Lynn amiably. What? Not rudely, but that was a good guess. Yep. Uh, well, since you've asked my advice, Marilla, said Mrs. Lynn amiably. You asked for my advice? Close. This means generally agreeable. Generally agreeable. So because Mrs. Lynn is flattered because Mrs. or because Marilla says, hey, can you help me out with this, right? So she's generally agreeable. Yes, I am. Thank you. Then you really think I better let her stay home? said Marilla in amazement. Yes, that is what, that is I wouldn't say school to her again until she said it herself. Depend upon it, Marilla. She'll cool off in a week or so and be ready enough to go back of her own accord. Do you think she's going to cool off in a week or so? That's, that's what. While if you were to make her go back right off, dear knows what freak or tantrum she'd take next. And make more trouble than ever. The less fuss made, the better, in my opinion. She won't miss much by not going to school, as far as that goes. Mr. Phillips isn't any good at all as a teacher. The order he keeps is scandalous. That's what. And he neglects the young fry and puts all his time on the big scholars he's getting ready for queens. What do you think young fry means? Yeah, the youngest of them. Fry means children. 
children. The young fry or the young children. He neglects the young children. Um, he never have got the school for another year if his uncle hadn't been a trustee. The trustee, for he just leads the other two around by the nose, that's what. I declare, I don't know what education in this island is com uh, what education in this island is coming to. Mrs. Rachel shook her head as much as to say if she were the on only at the head of the educational system of the Providence, things would be much better managed. Marilla took Mrs. Rachel's advice, and not another word was said to Anne about going back to school. She learned her lessons at home, did her chores, and played with Diana in the chilly purple autumn twilights. But when she met Gilbert Blythe on the road or encountered him in Sunday school, she passed by, passed him by with an icy contempt that was no whit thawed by his evident desire to appease her. Even Diana's efforts as a peacemaker were of no avail. Anne had evidently made up her mind to hate Gilbert Blythe to her to the end of her life. As much as she hated Gilbert, however, she did love Diana. With all the love of her passionate little heart, equal and tense in its likes and dislikes, one evening Marilla, coming in from the orchard with a basket of apples, found Anne sitting alone, along by the east twilight, East window in the twilight, crying bitterly. Whatever's the matter now, Anne, she asked. It's about Diana, I am sad. Luxuriously, I love Diana so, Marilla. I cannot ever live without her. But I know very well when we grow up that Diana will get married and go away and leave me. And oh, what shall I do? I hate her husband. I just hate him furiously. I've been imagining it all out. The wedding and everything. Diana dressed in snowy garments with a veil and looking as beautiful and regal as a queen. And me as a bridesmaid. With a lovely dress, too. And puff sleeves, but with a breaking heart hid beneath my smiling face. And I'm bidding Diana goodbye. <laughs> Here Anne broke down entirely and wept with increasing bitterness. Marilla turned away to hide her twitching face, but it was no use. She clasped on the nearest chair and burst into such a hearty and unusual peal of laughter that Matthew, crossing the yard outside, halted in amazement. <gasps> when he had he heard Marilla laugh like that before? Well, and surely, said Marilla, as soon as she could speak. If you must borrow trouble, for pity's sakes, borrow it handier home. I should think you had an imagination, sure enough. What do you think handier means? If I said my water glass, this one is handier than the other one, it means what? Closer, right? So, handier means nearer or closer. Nearer or closer. What? <laughs> well, if I said no, would you think I'm telling the truth? I, I, the water bottles make me smile. You have an Alma one and a lemon one. I, I have an Alma one and a lemon one. All right, moving on to chapter 16. Here we go. Yes. I can take care of your nose, no problem. That's what I thought. Chapter 16, Aesthetic. Uh, put the T down to draw, or put the T to draw. Um, and then says down. Adel painted. Beginning to work. Cookie. Cut out. Tumble, tumblerful. Entreated. Oh, gosh, this is another good chapter. Oi, oi, oi. Cloistered personified, 
Supplant. Malice. Uh oh. Diana is invited to tea with tragic results. This is why I like this. This is why I like this book because they're all good, right? That slate hitting chapter, favorite. This one, favorite. Not necessarily, but gosh, it's a good book. All right, here we go. October was a beautiful month at Green Gables. When the birches in the hollow turned as golden as sunshine and the maples behind the orchard were royal crimson, and the wild cherry trees along the lane put on the loveliest shades of dark red and bronzy green, while the fields sunned themselves in aftermaths and reveled in the world of color about her. Oh, Marilla, she exclaimed one Saturday morning, coming dan dancing in with her arms full of gorgeous bows. I'm so glad I live in a world where there are Octobers. It's actually a famous Anne of Green Gables quote. You can actually find it on plaques and stuff. I'm glad I live, so glad I live in a world where there are Octobers. It would be terrible if we just skipped from September to November, wouldn't it? Look at those maple branches. Don't they just give you a thrill? Several thrills? I'm going to decorate my room with them. Messy thing, said Marilla, whose aesthetic sense was not noticeably developed. What does aesthetic mean? What? Not different. Good try, though. It is a style. Um, in this case, it's a, like a pleasing. It's pleasing. Uh, an aesthetic. Somebody's aesthetic means it's pleasing to you. So, like, if you look around different cl different teachers' classrooms, you get an idea of their style or what's pleasing to them, what their sense is. Yeah, like my room. You get the sense of what the things I think are very cool. Yeah, I like crayons because they're colorful, right? Okay. Messy things, said Marilla, whose aesthetic sense was not noticeably developed. You clutter up your room entirely too much with the out-of-door stuff, and bedrooms were made to sleep in. All right. Oh, and dreaming too, Marilla. And you know one can dream so much better in a room where there are pretty things. I'm going to put these bows in the old blue jug up jug and set them on my table. Mind you, don't drop leaves all over the stairs then. I'm going to a meeting at the, the Aid Society in, at Carmody this afternoon. Anne and I won't likely be home before dark. You'll have to get Matthew and Jerry their supper, so don't forget to put the tea to draw until you sit down at the table as you did last time. What do you think put the tea to draw means? Yeah, so basically it means put it down or make tea. So it takes a while, once you put hot water over the tea bags, it takes it a while to seep and to be ready to drink. So basically it means make tea. So don't forget to make the tea before you sit down to dinner because they're going to want tea with their, their supper, right? Biscuits are cookies. That's good stuff. Um, it was dreadful of me to forget. Oops, hang on, I'll let you look at that. It was dreadful of me to forget, said Anne apologetically. But, it was, but that was the afternoon I was trying to think of a name for Violet Vale. And it crowded out, crowded other things out. Matthew was so good, he never scolded a bit. He put the tea down himself and said we could wait a while as well as not. And I told him a lovely fairy story while we were waiting, so he didn't find the time long at all. It was a beautiful fairy story, Marilla. I forget the, forgot the end of it, so I made up an end for myself. And Matthew said he couldn't tell where the join came in. Matthew would think it all right, Anne, if you took a notion to get up and have dinner in the middle of the night. But you keep your wits about you this time. And 
I really don't know if I'm doing it doing right. It might may make you more adulpated than ever. But you can ask Diana to come over and spend the afternoon with you and have tea here. What do you think adulpated means? Yep. Uh, and I really don't know if I'm doing right. It may make you more adulpated than ever. No. Adulpated. Stuck. Not mad, good try. Mixed up. Adult painted beans be means being mixed up. Might make you more adult painted. It might make you more mixed up. Oh, Marilla and clasp her hands. How perfectly lovely. You are able to imagine things after all, or else you would never have understood how I've longed for the very thing. It will seem so nice and grown upish. No fear of my forgetting to put the tea down to draw while I when I have company. Oh Marilla, can I use the rosebud tea set? Rosebud spray tea set? No indeed, the rosebud tea set. Well what's what next? You know I never use that except for the minister or the aides. You'll put down the old brown tea set, but you can open the little yellow crock of cherry preserves. It's time it was being used anyhow. I believe it's beginning to work. What do you think beginning to work means? No. Yeah, so beginning to work means it's getting it's getting close to spoiling. Getting close to spoiling. Hold on, I'll move it for you. Thank you. What? Yeah, expired. Yes, expired or rotting. Now, mind you, they didn't expire like we ex We have food that expires because the stuff that they did was mostly canned by themselves. Okay. And you can cut some fruit cake and have some of the cookies and snacks. So cookies and ginger snaps. I can just imagine myself sitting down at the head of the table and pouring out the tea, said Anne, shutting her eyes ecstatically and asking Diana if she takes sugar. I know she doesn't, but of course I'll ask her, just as if I don't know. I didn't know. And then pressing her to take another piece of fruit cake and helping to preserves. Oh, Marilla, it's a wonderful sensation just to think of it. Can I take her to the spare room to lay off her hat when she comes and then into the parlor to sit? No. The sitting room will do for you and your company. But there's a bottle of bottle half full of raspberry cordial that was left over from the church social the other night. It's on the second shelf of the sitting room closet and you and Diana can have it if you'd like. And a cookie to eat with it along in the afternoon. For I dare say Matthew will be late coming to tea since he's hauling potatoes to the vessel. What do you think cookie is? It's easy. Uh, it's actually fresh from the cookie. It is? Yeah. Yeah. It is the British spelling of cookie. Good catch. C-O-O-K-I-E. That is our kind of cookie. 
Oh, jeez, Miss Richardson. But it's better for you guys to see the words if I have it closer, right? But, uh, bit biscuit. Yeah, biscuit is uh, British. Maybe this. Maybe this is not the British. Maybe this is. Um, maybe it's Canadian. I don't know. All right. Um. Anne flew down to the hollow, past Dryad's bubble, and up the spruce path to Opal Orchard Slope to ask Diana to tea. As a result, just after Marilla had driven off to Carmody, Diana came over, dressed in her second best dress, and looking exactly as it is proper to look, and when, when asked out to tea. At other times, she was wont to run into the kitchen without knocking. It's like if you have a good friend, your good friend might just come into the house, right? Um, but because she's coming to tea... She's not running into the house. So, but now she knocked primly at the front door, and when Anne dressed in her in her second best, as primly opened it, both little girls shook hands gravely as if they had never met before. The unnatural Solomon, solemnity lasted until after Diana had taken had been taken to the the gate east gable to lay off her hat and then had sat for 10 minutes in the sitting room toes in position how is your mother inquired anne politely just as if she had not seen mrs barry picking apples that morning in excellent health and spirits she's very well thank you i suppose mr cuthbert is hauling potatoes to lily sands this afternoon is he said diana who had ridden down to mr Harmon andrews that morning in matthew's cart Yes, our potato crop is very good this year. I hope your father's crop is good, too. It is fairly good, thank you. Have you picked many of your apples yet? Oh, ever so many, said Anne, forgetting to be dignified and jumping up quickly. Let's go out to the orchard and get some of the red sweetings. Diana, Marilla says we can have all that are left on the tree. Marilla is a very generous woman. She said we could have fruit cake and cherry preserves for tea. But it isn't good manners to tell your company what you are going to give them to eat, so I won't tell you what she said we could have to drink. I oh, she did. That's what I was thinking. Only it begins with an R and a C and is bright red color. <gasps> I love bright red drinks, don't you? They taste twice as good as any other color. The orchard, with its great sweeping boughs, boughs that bent to the ground with fruit, proved so delightful that the little girl spent most of the afternoon in it, sitting in a grassy corner where the frost had spared the green and, yellow, green and mellow autumn sunshine. Lingered warmly, eating apples and talking as hard as they could. Diana had so much to tell Anne that of what went on in school, because right now Anne's still not in school, right? She had to sit with Gertie Pie. Anne hated it. Gertie squeaked her pencil all the time, and it just made her, Diana's, blood run cold. Ruby Gillis had charmed all her warts away. True as you live, with a magic pebble that old Mary Jo from the creek gave her. You have to rub the warts with the pebble, then throw it away over your left shoulder at the time of the new moon, and the warts will all go. Charlie Sloan's name was written up with M. White's on the porch wall, and M. White was awful mad about it. Sam Bolter had sassed Mr. Phillips in class. Oopsies, or man. And Mr. Phillips had whipped him, and Sam's father had come down to the school and dared Mr. Phillips to lay, lay a hand on one of his children again. And Maddie Andrews had the red, new red hood with a blue crossover with tassels on it. And the air she put on about it were perfectly sickening. And Lizzie Wright didn't speak to Ma Mamie Wilson because Mamie Wilson's grown-up sister had cut out Lizzie Wright's grown-up sister with her bow. And everybody missed Anne so and wished she'd come to school again and Gilbert Blythe. What do you think cut out means? Cut out. 
Yeah, you're close. You are close. Um, what's the name? Um, what's the name? Um, Not come sit down. Just cutting. Oh, you're thinking cutting while you're sitting down. Is that what you said? Say it one more time. It's not cutting something. They had cut her sister out. What? No. Wow, that's a good idea, though. Stole. Had stole. Her. Boyfriend. So one girl, one girl's sister stole another girl's sister's boyfriend. So she's not talking to her right now. Not right now. I'm not. All right. Uh, had cut. So Mamie Wilson's grown-up sister had stolen Lizzie Wright's grown-up sister with her bow her boyfriend, and everybody missed Anne so. But Anne didn't want to hear about Gilbert Blythe. She jumped up hurriedly and said, suppose they go in and have some raspberry cordial. R.C., red color, raspberry cordial. Anne looked on the second shelf of the room pantry, but there was no bottle of raspberry cordial there. Search revealed it away back on the top shelf. Anne put it on the tray and set it on the table with a tumbler. Now please help yourself, Diana, she said politely. I don't believe I'll have any just now. I don't feel as if I wanted any after all those apples. So sometimes if you've just eaten a lot of something, you might not want a drink, right? So she's like, I just ate a bunch of apples. I don't really want to drink ap or raspberry cordial. Diana poured, Diana poured herself a tumbler full, looked at its bright red hue admirably, admiringly, and sipped it daintily. What is a tumbler full? Tumbler full. What kind of a lot is it? Okay, hang on, we'll try to. Yeah, so a tumbler full is a drinking glass without a foot or stem. So basically, yeah, tum, yeah, tumble, tumble, yeah. So it's a drinking glass without. A foot, oops, a foot or stem. Well, some glasses have like this kind of thing on there. Like wine glasses or something like that. It doesn't have one of those. Okay? I am. Uh, yeah, it'd be kind of like my water bottle, or it's not like a wine glass. It's not like sometimes the fancy glasses that aren't wine glasses have a stem or a foot. No, not a handle. It's something, a foot would be like, a foot would be like, in this case, they're talking, a foot is like, here's my glass. You, you might have a foot like this. Like a, like some kind of a stemmy type thing at the bottom, or it's something like a stem like that. Okay. You can. It's made out of glass or whatever. All right. Um. That's awfully nice from raspberry cordial, and she said, "I didn't know raspberry cordial was so nice." 
I'm real glad you like it. Take as much as you want. I'm going to run out and stir up the fire. Stir the fire up. There are so many responsibilities on a person's mind when they're keeping house, isn't there? When Anne came back from the kitchen, Diana was drinking her second glass full of cordial. And being entreated there, too, by Anne, she offered no particular objection to drinking a third. Now, I don't know about you. But if you go to somebody's house and they offer you a glass of pop or a glass of juice and you drink, not, no, I'm not talking water, and you drink the whole glass and then they say, go ahead, take another, take another. And then you take another glass and you drink in another glass. Are you going to drink the third glass of pop or the third glass of juice or something like that? Juice, yeah. All right, so entreated means entreated. So when she was entreated, so she, to plead with or ask urgently. What? I would not. I mean... If I was still hungry, I might take a second piece of something, depending. I no, I I now if it if it's if it's water maybe, but I mean you know it's kind of a polite type of thing, right? So being entreated there to by Anne, she offered no particular objection. You're gonna have to wait to the drinking of a third. The tumblerfuls were generous ones, and the raspberry cordial was certainly very nice. The nicest I've ever drank, said Diana. It's ever so much nicer than Mrs. Lynn's, although she brags of her so much. It doesn't taste a bit like hers. I should think Marilla's raspberry cordial would probably be much nicer than Mrs. Lynn's, said Anne loyally. Marilla is a famous cook. She is trying to teach me to cook, but I assure you, Diana, it is uphill work. There is so little for scope. Uh, there is little, so little scope for the imagination and cookery. You just have to go by the rules. The last time I made the cake, I forgot to put the flour in. I was thinking the loveliest story about you and me, Diana. I thought you were desperately ill with smallpox and everybody deserted you. But I went boldly to your bedside and nursed you back to life. Then I took the smallpox and died. I was buried under those poplar trees in the graveyard, and you planted a rose bush by my grave and watered it with your tears. And you never, never forgot the friend of your youth who sacrificed her life for you. Oh, it was such a pathetic tale, Diana. The tears just rained down over my cheeks while I mixed the cake, but I forgot the flour, and the cake was a dismal failure. Flour is so essential to cakes, you know. Marilla was very cross, and I don't wonder. I'm a great trial to her. She was terribly mortified about the pudding sauce last week. We had plum pudding for dinner on Tuesday. <laughs> and there was half the pudding and a pitcher full of sauce left over. Marilla said there was enough for another dinner and told me to set it on the pantry shelf and cover it. I'll think you covered it. Just as much, I'm, um, I meant to cover it just as much as could be, Diana. But when I carried it in, I was imagining I was a nun, of course. I'm a Protestant, but I imagine I was Catholic, taking the veil to bury a broken heart in cloistered seclusion. And I forgot all about covering the pudding sauce. I thought it was, I thought of it the next morning and ran to the pantry. Diana Fancy, you can ex if you can ex can my extreme horror to find a mouse drowned it in that pudding sauce. I lifted the mouse out with a spoon and threw it out in the yard. And then I washed the spoon three times or er, spoon in three waters. Marilla was out milking and I fully intended to tell her when she came in. If I'd given the sauce, to, if I'd given this, give the sauce to the pigs. But when she did come in, I was imagining that I was a frost fairy going through the woods, turning the trees red and yellow, whichever they wanted to be. 
So I never thought about the pudding sauce again. And Marilla sent me out to pick apples. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Chester Ross from Spencerville came here that morning. You know, they are very stylish people, especially Mrs. Chester Ross. When Marilla called me in, to din in dinner was already and everybody was at the table. I tried to be as polite and dignified as I could be, for I wanted Mrs. Chester Ross to think I was a lady-like little girl, even if I wasn't pretty. Everything went right until I saw Marilla coming out with the plum pudding in one hand and the pitcher of pudding sauce warmed up in the other. Diana. That was a terrible moment. I remembered everything, and I stu just stood up in my place and shrieked out, Marilla, oh, you mustn't use the pudding sauce. There was a mouse drowning in it. I forgot to tell you before. Oh, Diana, I shall never forget that awful moment if I live to be a 100. Mrs. Chester Ross just looked at me, and I thought I would sink through the floor with mortification. She is the perfect housekeeper, and fancy what she must have thought of us. Marilla turned red as fire, but she never said a word then. She just carried that sauce and pudding out and brought in some strawberry preserves. She even offered me some, but I couldn't swallow a mouthful. It was like heaping coals of fire on my head. After Mrs. Chester Ross went away, Marilla gave me a dreadful scolding. Why, Diana, what is the matter? Diana had stood up unsteadily very unsubtly and then she sat down again and putting her hands to her head i'm i'm awfully sick she said a little thickly i i i must go right home oh you mustn't dream of going home without your tea cried anne in distress i'll i'll get it right off i'll, I'll go and put the tea down this very minute i must go home repeated diana stupidly but determinedly let me get you a lunch anyhow, implored Anne. Let me give you a bit of fruit cake and some of the cherry preserves. Lie down on the sofa for a little while and, and you'll feel better. Where do you feel bad? I must go home, said Diana. And that was all she would say. In vain, Anne pleaded. I never, I never had. I never heard of company going home without tea, she mourned. Oh, Diana, do you suppose that it's possible that you're really taking the smallpox? If you are, I'll go and nurse you. You can depend on that. I I'll never forsake you. But I do wish you'd stay till after tea. Where do you feel bad? All right, we are going to stop there. Oh, and it just gets better. I'm not even going to lie to you. It just gets better. Let's look back at chapter 15 questions really quick. Um, let's do three and four. So question three, what happened when Gilbert teased Anne about her red hair? And then you can do what has been your favorite part in the story so far and why. Okay. Any questions for me? Good. I'm not going to, you have, I just, you, there has to be something you've enjoyed about the book so far. There has to be. Yeah, I was being nice. Is that all right with you? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.